Today we're talking canning and preserving with Ashley Anderman, a Baton Rouge-based food artisan, we call her the Jam Master, who owns Grinning Jupiter Jammery. Ashley has a background in photography, having studied fine art at LSU and previously being the purveyor of her own studio. These days, Ashley is known for her jams, jellies, preserves, syrups, and pickles through her business, Grinning Jupiter. Ashley has a classic Avion trailer that has been converted into her jam kitchen where she cans, jams, and preserves according to what fruits are available that season. You can also find Ashley often foraging for her own ingredients, sometimes with the help of her husband and nephews. Um, but you'll know Grinning Jupiter product when you see it. It has the colorful fabric on top of each jar, handpicked and coordinated by Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Hello. How are you? I'm doing good. Good. Well, I'm excited to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. So we have been, we've known each other for seven years now. I, I bought this shop seven years ago. I remember the first time I walked into the shop and, uh, Angela, my old neighbor, introduced us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And she was like, you've got to meet her. You've got to carry her products. And um, I just fell in love with them. And they were also um, speaking to, not a problem, but definitely a question I was getting in the shop a lot about pepper jellies and muscadines, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. But I want to, the first <laughs> thing I want to talk about is this kitchen that you have that you cook out of mm -hmm. on your property. And it is an Avion trailer yes. and looks a little bit like an Airstream. Yeah. But tell us about the Avion, how that happened, because that's adorable. Well, Avion, uh, I was looking for an Airstream mm -hmm. and I came across the Avion and it's kind of described the Airstream would be a Cadillac, the Avion's a Chevrolet. Um, uh, so we found it and then my husband and my brother both redid it for me and made it into a kitchen. So it's nice to have, you know hands helping. We gutted it, put new floors in it. And uh, now I just love it. Like it's my perfect space. I needed to get out of our own kitchen and have a bigger space so I could just work uh, without having too many distractions. So it's your own private place to be creative, but it's also certified. Yes. So what was that conversation with the DHH inspector like when they came to inspect uh, your kitchen and your trailer? Uh, it's not a normal, it's not, it doesn't really have its own category. Okay. You know, so you had to kind of move around and manipulate a few things to make everything fit into that small space. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the biggest change was all the electrical work. Okay. You know, like, because it's still at my house, but it had to be connected to a source. So we had to put a new electrical box on the house to connect it and then rewire the whole thing and... <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not that you have a lot of space between, so all the wiring had to go on the outside, you mm -hmm. know, so it almost looks a little more industrial inside because mm -hmm. it's got conduit, metal conduit going everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was probably the most intensive work it needed, you know. So we photographed it a few years back uh, when we did a blog post on you. So we're going to post all those pictures in the show notes for folks to see this because this is this is pretty, yeah, I, pretty interesting. I color coordinated it with... Uh, the colors of the Bahama uh, of the Bahamas, so okay. it's all their colors of their flag. Okay, I was like, I wanted it to have a feel of just relaxing and calming. And yeah, so that's kind of what I yeah. did. Yeah. Okay, so I want to talk today about you know canning, and it's it's a big topic, mm -hmm. and I have some real specific takeaways I want my listeners to walk away with, which I know we're going to get there. Okay, but I am curious what your take is on because suddenly. Everything that's old is new again. Mm -hmm. So everyone's super interested in canning. We put jams and jellies classes on the schedule. They sell out very, very quickly. Um, people come in, they're, they're genuinely um, interested, but also genuinely like sort of perplexed over the whole thing. And I'll be honest, my, so I grew up like in the 70s and 80s, and I don't remember my mom doing it. But I remember my grandmother doing it. So I, th you know, I think it's easy to, to say that, you know, my mom worked outside of the home. Once women started working outside of the home more and grocery stores started stocking more, you know, easily, to, easy to grab processed food, then that went away. Do you agree that that was kind of when it Yeah, I definitely happened? think uh, we were bombarded with a ton of processed food and mm -hmm. it gave us no need to have to go forage or put up food. Okay. So 
you know, when we think about it today, it's sort of like this special thing that people are doing as like gift giving or have something really special, but really it comes from a place of necessity and yeah. preservation. Yes. And making use of what was a abundant. Yeah. And a lot of people too used to have gardens and it used to be more accessible to find wild fruit and you'd have a lot of trees, fig trees, citrus trees around. Um, it's a little harder to find these days. Um, mm -hmm. I think the biggest part of it is people are becoming more aware of their food and where it's coming from. And if they can uh, find it themselves and put it up themselves, they feel that they're giving their family something uh, that's maybe not chocked full of, I don't want to say poisons, but you know, a lot of things that are going to be harmful to you. And then I think the second thing is it brings back a lot of memories. Ah. And I think that's a big part of it. I find with a lot of my customers, uh, it makes them think of their family again. You know, like they taste their grandma when they, you know, they're like, oh, remember that. You know, it's like Mayhaw jelly for me. It's a memory jelly. Mm -hmm. Like I completely think of my grandmother, you know, or figs. So I think it's a lot to do with it too. It's something they haven't had in a while and it's familiar and it feels good. So that's a perfect segue because I want to talk about Mayhaws. Mm -hmm and muscadines, because those were two ingredients that customers, when I first bought the store and before I stocked your products, they mm -hmm. came in asking me for mayha jelly or muscadine jelly. So I know you forge for both, right? Not so much mayha anymore. Now I actually have a local farmer that I use. Okay. Um, and I have to say, most of the Mayhaw foraging, I have to give credit to my husband and my in-laws, because if I couldn't make it out, we get them from North Louisiana, and if I couldn't make it there, they would go get them. So they would drive three, four hours, pick all the Mayhaws for me, drive home, and then I would sort and then juice. You know? Okay, so what does a Mayhaw look like, and, and what does it grow on, and where do you go find it? It grows in a tree. Um, it looks kind of like a little baby apple. Um, like, it's oh. really tiny, though. Like maybe the size of a nickel, okay. you know, like not too big. Um, if you're going to look for it wild, it's going to be somewhere swampy and marshy. It likes a lot of water. Uh, so a lot of people will find them in the swamps. I know a lot of people find them in like uh, Tunica Hills. That's kind of, you know, local around here. Um, it's not really a fruit that you would eat off the tree. Okay, that was my next question. If I bit into it, what would that be like? It's a little bitter. Okay. You know, it's it's definitely uh, makes a beautiful jelly, but it's not a fruit you would snack on. Okay. Okay. And let's talk about a muscadine. Now, a muscadine is so a, a fruit muscadine for on. me. Childhood that was wine mm -hmm. in my family. So tell us about a muscadine. Where where are they? How do you find them? Uh, some people now you'll find muscadine farms. Uh, I'm lucky to have in laws that live in the Homochitta National Forest in Mississippi. Oh wow! And so muscadines and scuppernogs all come from that forest. And so you can wild pick them. Scuppernogs. Which grows uh, alongside muscadines. It's more of a yellow-green grape. Tastes almost identical. Like if you were blindfolded with a taste test, you'd think they're both muscadines. Okay. Okay. But it's a great name. It is. It's a, it's a fantastic name. Um, okay. So let's talk about jams, jellies, and preserves. Mm -hmm. Can you define each of those? Yeah. So a jelly is made with only juice. A jam is your fruit that's either mashed or pureed up. And then preserves, you're going to have whole pieces of fruit in it. Okay. And depending on what's in season, what, you know, we, we think is going on, sort of like um, in terms of like gift giving, when mm -hmm. we get closer to the holidays, we teach something different. When you teach jams and jellies, yep. that, that changes each time. So when are you more likely to teach a preserve in, in our classes versus, say, a jam? Probably into spring, beginning of summer, um, because it's blackberry and blueberry season. Um, figs is middle of July. It's weird. Our seasons have been changing the last two years, mm -hmm. but fig is still somewhere in July. Sometimes a little goes into a little of August, but probably beginning of summer. Okay. And you and I talk about figs a lot because figs are delicious. up until last year, I never paid for a fig in my life. <laughs> so you just wait for your neighbor's tree to get full of figs and mm -hmm. then at night go and take them. you climb the fence <laughs> yes and you pick the figs especially Absolutely. neighbors who are just letting them fall to the ground yeah, if you're letting fruit fall to the ground then it's fair game because all that is is getting squirrels drunk yeah 
It, um, they will get drunk off fermented yes. fruit. <laughs> but um, we've had, you know, I think just the rise in popularity of local food is why figs are not that easy to find. And they're expensive if you find them. Yeah. Like, even at a farmer's market, a pint of figs is like $6. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, that's seven, eight figs. So <laughs> if you have that fig tree in your backyard, definitely pick them and do something with them. Don't yeah. leave them for the squirrels. Or, I don't have anything them. against squirrels. But, or just yeah. freeze them till you find somebody who wants them. Yeah. You know, like, you can, you can find someone who wants your figs. Okay, so let's talk about the process of starting a canning project. First of all, when you come in my shop, your instruction is is very specific. So I don't like a lot of rules around food. Mm -hmm. I I feel like there's a lot of what's right and what's wrong out there in the food world. And I think it factors a lot into why folks aren't cooking. They think they're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to this technique, the rules very, very much matter because you are then... Um, on that line of foodborne illness. Yes. And it's also too, it's, they matter if you're going to put it away. If you're just making a jar or two that you're going to throw in your fridge or your freezer, you don't have to be as strict with it, you know, but if you're putting it up and giving it to people, you should definitely follow the rules. Okay. So you don't have a big library of resource materials that you turn to. You have some very specific texts that you recommend mm-hmm. to customers because, and you always talk about, you know, customers always say, say like they make a strawberry uh, jam. And then they every single class they say, okay, so I can do this with you know, another type of fruit. And you always say, make sure you're using a reputable recipe. Yes. So you have just a handful of texts that you refer to. Tell us about what those are. Um, well, the first book I ever bought was the introduction to canning from Ball, which I still use. Um, and that's and, the brand Ball Jars. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I stick with those quite a bit. And they've got two books out now. Um, it's You'll find a lot of the same information in a lot of books, but They'll differ a little between like types of pectin to use, how long to cook. Um, but I mostly stick with the ball book. Uh, okay. So when it comes to equipment, if someone said, oh, I want to make a few jars of jelly, they probably have equipment in their kitchen that could get them there. Yeah, you don't need to go out and buy anything right away, you know, unless you become enthusiastic about it and you want to keep doing it, then it's nice to have your own set of canning equipment, but you can find things throughout the house to use. Okay. So let's talk about what those key things are before you even start. You need um, a really big pot. Yeah, you need, uh, see, some some people say you need a big pot. Some people don't. I like a very large non-reactive pot that gives it plenty of room because it's going to boil and it's going to come up to a good boil and you don't want it to boil over. So when you say non-reactive pot, we're talking about the pot that you're going to be cooking. That you're going to be cooking in, yes. The fruit or or maybe vegetable, but probably fruit in. Yes. That's why it's non-reactive. Yes, okay. because you don't want to change the uh, acid level. Okay. Yes. So let's back up a little bit. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about jars, just getting the jars ready, because this is something that you arrive to the classes mm-hmm. a good bit early because you need that time for that pot of water yeah. to come up to a simmer. So talk about what's happening. So when I'm canning, I, you, you're going to have to seal in a water bath of boiling water. I always have that uh, water bath going and ready for, before I even start cooking. Um, two reasons. I don't want to have to wait for it to come to a boil when I'm ready for my jars to go in. But also it's a sterilization for the jars also. So after you've cleaned the jars, while you're cooking, I like to set my jars into the pot and it gives them another sterilization, and then I pull them out at a time to fill them, and then go back into the pot. Okay, so here we are. We are wanting to do a berry preserve, mm-hmm. and we went to antique shops, mm-hmm. and we bought beautiful vintage jars. Tell us about because you bring them with you yeah. to the class, lo- but I we don't ever jars. preserve in them. No, uh, a lot of reasons for that is. You don't uh, know the quality of the jar that it's still in. And a lot of times they're going to have hairline fractures you don't see. So you go ahead and you fill the jar up and you're putting it in boiling water. That jar will explode. Um, okay. 
And then some jars too, you just don't know what exactly went into making that glass at the time that was food safe at one point that may not be food safe now. Okay. So it's just best to keep them for like dry ingredients or decorative, you know. Okay. And don't get me wrong, they're gorgeous. Like I collect them, I love all of them, so. Uh, you bring them to the to yeah. the shop and I love looking at them. Um, but better to have them on your shelf yes. decoratively than to actually can them. And then actually too, um, Ball has come out with a lot of uh, replicas of all their old jars. Mm -hmm. So if you like the look, you can definitely get it in a new jar that looks like the old jar. So jars that have been purchased, say, within the past, you know, let's say 10 years, mm -hmm. you're, as long as no chips, cracks, you're fine with re-sterilizing and making another batch in those jars. Yeah, I probably would just switch out the lids, you know. Right. Yeah. But I would still use the glass jars. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've got our jars sterilized, mm -hmm. and we are getting ready to make our mixture, let's say it's blueberry. And so what are the, what are, what are the key ingredients there? Let's see, if we were making blueberry preserves, uh, we'd have our blueberries, mm -hmm. whole, uh, sugar, and then we would need lemon juice because blueberries are low acid. We need them to be high acid. All of that would go in. We'd bring it to a boil and then we would use pectin. Okay. Talk about the lemon juice, though, because this was very, very fascinating to me when I first learned this from you. So when a recipe calls for lemon juice, it's because we want to make uh, the pH to a high acid and not a low acid. And we're going to use bottled lemon juice because it's a consistent pH. Fascinating. So you always grab that bottle of lemon juice versus using fresh lemons, which I know is a little off-putting to some customers. They're like, it needs to be fresh. We need to be using, you know, but for your end result to be consistent and for you to know it's safe, that bottled lemon juice is, it gives you, you know what that pH yeah, is. Yeah, and for something like uh, blueberry preserves, you're not even tasting the lemon. Like you won't even taste the lemon juice in it. But if we were making lemon blueberry preserves, we would use fresh lemons. Okay. So now you've made your preserves. They're in your sterilized jars. Mm -hmm. Your lids go on and the lids are typically two pieces. And that flat piece that goes inside the ring mm -hmm. has a little piece of, is that rubber on there or some sort of? It's, it's a material, a compound that uh, when it will warm up and get soft. And then when your seal is pulling down, it'll harden again and it'll seal to the jar. And so they are one use, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. You don't reuse those. No. But rings and jars you can use. Yes, over and over. Absolutely. And we've had the sweetest thing take place in the store. Customers bring back your jars. Yes, I love that they bring back jars. And because they want them to be recycled. And then she makes more jam or jelly in them. And what I do too, uh, since I do a lot of farmer's markets, I offer them a discount. So for every jar they bring back, I give them a dollar off of a jelly. Stop it. I so love some it. people will wait till they have quite a bit of jars. And like some aren't even my jars. I'm like, Where'd you get these jars? You didn't get them from me, but I'll still honor it and they'll get like three free jellies, you know. Love that. Okay. Let's talk about a very specific type of jelly now. So then, so to go back, you said jelly is made with juice. Yes. But let's talk about pepper jelly mm -hmm. because could, at Christmas, you can't keep up with the Baton Rouge demand for pepper jelly. Yeah. Let's just talk about pepper um, so our good. voracious appetite for pepper jelly. It goes so go on everything. I I'll, I think this is a Southern tradition. Who knows? It may be all over the country. But pepper jelly on a block of cream cheese with Ritz crackers, right? I think it is more of a Southern thing. I have a lot of a lot of friends who live up north, and it's they get a kick out of putting it out for their friends. And yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? Ah. What is this? You know? And then, of course, you fall in love with it. It's right. delicious. Right. So talk us through what I would call the the basic core pepper jelly that is green. T talk about what goes in there. So uh, basic pepper jelly, my version of a basic pepper jelly is, uh, I've got two. I've got one that's just straight jalapenos, if you just need a little more heat, and the one that's a bell pepper jalapeno mix. Which is where the green is coming from. The green, it does, it is green, but it's more of a swampy green. Um, the green pepper jelly you see in the stores, that's from food coloring. There's oh. no way it comes out that bright. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's more, it's like when I make mint jelly and people look at it, they're like, but it's not bright green. I'm like, because I didn't put food coloring in it. Uh -huh. You know, it's more swampy green, which works fine for here. So with those blueberries, we had sugar, acid, pectin. What's happening with the pepper jelly? What's in that pot? So in pepper jelly, you're going to have your peppers. Mm-hmm. 
Um, it was just a straight pepper jelly. It's peppers, apple cider vinegar, sugar, and pectin. But uh, it could be any flavor, you know, blueberries, strawberry, pecans, you know. And that's the one that's selling like crazy right now is your pecan pepper jelly. I think I think everything with pecans, people right. love. And I do, you know. Yeah. But there's so many good functions to it. Because they're great with cream cheese. They're great on baked brie. They're great as glazes, you know. And then it's the easiest thing to put out on holidays. Okay. So we've got either our pepper jelly or our preserve in the jar. We've got our lids on. We haven't re reused our inner mm -hmm. sealing lid. And it's going in the water bath. And there's going to be this moment when that seal, sometimes you can visit, or do you always visibly see it suck down? You can. That's going to happen when it comes back out the water bath. I see. Okay. So it's going back in the water bath for a few things. Um, to give it another heat source to kill any bacteria. Mm -hmm. But then once you're taking it back out of the water and it's sitting on the counter, that's when you're going to see the seal come down. So, you can see it in here. Okay. Are you both... So you feel confident because you know you've been in the water for the right amount of time, and then you've visibly seen the seal. Mm -hmm. do, and then after, if you, if you haven't, you can just feel the top of the jar. And okay. if it's still bouncing on the top, then it has not sealed. Okay. So let's say a whole bunch of listeners at this point are super nervous. Mm -hmm. And they're like, mm, I don't want to give that to my friends. What if I get someone sick? What What can they do to... To not have to worry about that layer of it. Well, first off, uh, it's very simple to can. Um, I think the nerves, it's just because you're trying something new. Mm -hmm. But once you've done it a few times, you'll realize it's very easy to do. And then also, you're not cook giving them or cooking anything low acid. And that's where the most danger comes in is low acid with a pressure canner. You're doing high acid with a water bath. And the worst that's going to happen is it may not have the shelf life. It may not have set right, but you're not going to harm someone. Okay. What is a low acid food? So most food, a lot is low acid, um, and we make it high acid. But like, I see. Okay. If you were doing, if you were canning just a can of green beans, mm -hmm. you would need a pressure canner for that. I see. And that's where more of your toxins and bacteria are going to come into play. Okay. But before that um, canning step, going into the water bath happens. Couldn't that jar go in the fridge? Uh, once it comes to room temperature. Okay. Yes. And then you've made a fridge jelly or fridge jam mm -hmm. that has a shorter shelf life. Yep. And really no true room temp shelf life. We're mm -hmm. talking about parking in the fridge. Mm -hmm. But you could pass that out to friends, make sure they yes. store it in the fridge and use it within probably 10 days, two weeks. If it's going, if they're keeping it cold as mm -hmm. they're transferring it around, it could go up to three, four months. Okay. You know, okay. this depends on what it is. Like, uh lemon curd you know that's a beautiful thing to give out to people but it does need to be refrigerated after it's cooked okay all right i want to move to pickles because and we had a great segue a second ago because you talked a little bit about apple mm -hmm. cider vinegar mm -hmm. in the pepper jelly so one thing that we get a lot of questions about are we sell balsamic vinegars yes. They are um, delicious and wonderful, but they behave very differently than white distilled vinegar or clear distilled vinegar mm -hmm. or apple cider vinegar. But we get a lot of questions about it, and you actually uh, came up with some ways that we can incorporate some balsamic vinegar while still staying safe yes. um, in what we're pickling. Mm -hmm. So pickling classes didn't... Um, last too long at red stick spice because um the vinegar had a in peppers overwhelming. it was a little overwhelming we had some coughing we had to yeah. you know evacuate to the parking lot i think once the jalapenos kicked in that yeah. really took over the store so we started looking at our options for a ventilation system yeah. and as soon as that's in place we'll be able to start pickling again um because that is something for me pickling is um way more approachable than the jams and jellies. And it's something, too, that you don't even have to really have a water bath to can. Like, there's so many, like, quick and easy pickle recipes that goes from doing this real quick and putting it in the fridge, you know? So talk about the acid. Talk about my balsamics. There was a particular pH we needed to be at, and it required me, you know, finding out what the pH of each balsamic was. So normally what I do is, uh, when I've come up with a recipe, is I'll do a mixture 
of usually the white vinegar with the balsamic. That way we're not losing the flavor of the balsamic because mm-hmm. apple cider can sometimes um, overwhelm a little. Mm-hmm. But I found, too, uh, that they work great in so many things, like in so many jams. Like I use a lot of your balsamics and preserves and jams and everything else. They have great flavor for it. So give us some examples of some of the jams you make with uh, our balsamics. A fig uh, balsamic and onion jam. Stop it. So it's a savory and it goes on burgers and pork chops and things like that. And you could put that on a cheese board. Oh, absolutely. A, oh, it's a, a great, condiment. yeah, it's a great charcuterie board. Yeah. Um, then also do a strawberry balsamic jam and a blueberry balsamic jam. And then use your 18, uh, 18 year yes. aged. And really it does, it just, it just brightens up the flavor of the fruit. Mm-hmm. Like it's a really intense blueberry flavor, a really intense strawberry flavor. That's interesting. Yeah. It just highlights it. Yeah. Because yeah. I only, I only put two tablespoons. In the whole batch, you know. Okay, let's talk, let's go back to pickling. Mm-hmm. So when you do um, traditional pickling, let's say you're making a bread and butter. First of all, what is a bread and butter pickle? It's a, a sweet and oniony pickle. Okay. And what do you sell the most of when, when you do pickling? Oh, I, sell, I do a pretty good even amount between bread and butters and dill. Dill and spicy dill. Okay. And so does the difference between the two come with the ingredients that's in the brine or is it the pickling spice? Um, well, first, I only brine the bread and butters. I okay. brine those for around 24 hours. Okay. Um, and that's a mixture of pickling salt, onions, and garlic, and cucumbers. Okay. And they sit in the fridge with ice over them. Uh, but that's a hot pack pickle and a dill is a cold pack pickle. Okay. So we've got to go over all of that because I thought the brine mm-hmm. was the hot liquid, the vinegar and a little bit of sugar and salt that you pour over the vegetables. Yes, in a cold pack it is the brine. But okay. in my uh, in the bread and butters, once they've sat that way for a while and they've made their own liquid, mm-hmm. then you uh, drain it and then you have another brine that's got your vinegar, your turmeric, your celery seed, mustard seed. And then those all go in together and get cooked. Okay. But when you're doing a dill, it's going to be a cold pack. So you just cut up your cucumber Mm -hmm. and you're going to pack it into your hot jar with your ingredients of your dill, your fresh dill, maybe some garlic. Um, And then the separate pot is your vinegar and your pickling salt. Okay. And then that will go over it and brine it in the jar, but you didn't cook that uh, cucumber down. Okay. And we get a lot of questions about pickling salt. Mm Um, and pickling salt is simply a, a clean salt that is a rather small grain. Yes, similar to uh, a lot of kosher salts. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it doesn't have uh, the caking ingredient that like I what's iodized salt has. Right. Yeah. And, and then those an- anti-caking agents that yeah. keep it free flowing. Yeah. So um, it you know we have it available at the store, but then you know lots of stores have it labeled as pickling salt, mm-hmm. but it's not. Any, you know, we're still talking NaCl, you know, it's still sodium chloride. Yeah. Um, it's just the grain size and no other, you know, added yes. ingredients to it. And that's so something that it's so frustrating when you are trying to shop, feed yourself and feed your family is so many things are added. You know, like it's even hard to say, oh, I want to make pickles. I'm going to go to the grocery store and buy cucumbers. Mm-hmm. And you're full of wax cucumbers, you know, like, ah. and there's no, no one there to tell you, well, I need to clean the wax off because that's going to change my pickle, you know, once I get it all together, you know, it's very frustrating that there's so many things that are added in that we're not even really aware of, you know. Where are you getting your pickles for pickling, your cucumbers for pickling? You just have to find the local produce, producer, you know, um, but still you can run the risk of like, if, you know, not naming names or anything of like where you were used to a product and then things changed and you realize uh, that they were wax. Yeah. I think the best thing to do is grow your own, but you're not going to have those all season long, mm-hmm. you know? So in order for me to have some flavors all season long, I will have to find some uh, producers that are outside of the state of Louisiana, you know, but I try to keep everything uh, as close to home as possible. So I have a lot of freezers, you know, like, I freeze my mayhaws, my blackberries, my blueberries, my figs to try to have them all year round. So if you weren't going to cucumber, uh, pickle a cucumber, what would you pickle? Pineapple. What? Pineapple. Pickle pineapple. So delicious. Oh my goodness. And it's sweeter. You know, it still has a good vinegar base, but it's 
sweeter and uh, it's cooked with cloves and cinnamon sticks. Oh, yum. It's really good. That's amazing. And of course, I'll pickle jalapenos because my mm -hmm. lo husband loves jal pickled jalapenos. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you got to open every window and door when you're pickling those. I just sent up a jar to a lady in Wisconsin and she sent me back. She was like, I'm pretty sure they cleared my sinus. Like I was just oh. at the doctor. I was like, yeah, they're hot. Yeah. They're yeah. really hot. Yeah. <laughs> what's the, what's an ingredient that people wouldn't expect? Uh, uh, you got me on pineapple, I'll admit, but what's another ingredient folks wouldn't you expect to be pickled? Um, I pickle a lot of zucchini and squash um, oh. and I'll pickle them like a bread and butter pickle. Mm -hmm. And really it's just, you get so much zucchini and squash during the season. It's right. like, I have to figure out things to do with this much zucchini and squash. I can't right. keep eating this much zucchini and squash. No, we call it the, the squash situation. I mean, it, it's yeah. so much. So I'm like, oh, it makes a beautiful pickle. Um, also, I'll take the zucchini and make a relish, a zucchini relish. Okay. Which is basically the same as pickling. You're using pickling salt and vinegars and everything. And so what makes it a relish? The cut? The, the way the, you... Basically, all you're doing is substituting... A cucumber for a uh, zucchini. Okay. So you keep the same, it's like a sweet relish. I mean, okay. but you can switch it up a little. So when you pickle zucchini and cucumber, th that integrity stays, that good crunchiness stays? Well, it, not when you're doing bread and butter because it's going to be cooked down. So bread and butters are never really crunchy. You mm -hmm. know, like now granted, now they do have a lot of um, quick and easy pickle stuff out there on the market mm -hmm. and you can make a crunchy bread and butter. Mm-hmm. And it just goes in your fridge real quick. But mine are actually cooked, so they're not a crunchy pickle. Okay. Um, beets? You know, I want to love the beet. I do. <laughs> but I really haven't it's a, accepted it. It's a polarizing it. Yeah, I ingredient. I haven't accepted it yet. I had a wonderful experience with it when we were in Prague, and I just haven't gone back to it. Yet. Okay. We'll get I you there. I probably need to give it another chance. Yeah, I enjoy a pickled beet. Watermelon rind? Now, that's out of laziness because it's a lot of work. And so wait, I, wait, why? So I just don't, I just don't, a lot of people want it. And I'm just like, there's no part of me that wants to do it. I'm really bad about that. Why? I know I should. And maybe. Because there's so many of them in the summer. Yeah. All right. Yeah, there's an, there's plenty too. of watermelon to go to round. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Okay. Well, this was awesome having you on. And so I have one last question for you. Um, and then we're going to let everybody know where to find you. Okay. So I ask every guest a version of this question. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask it to you this way. If you had to teach a novice cook one thing to can, what would you teach? It would definitely be a pepper jelly because you can use it in so many ways. And I'm guessing it would probably be... I'm going to go with blackberry pepper jelly. It's really? probably my favorite pepper jelly, but it's so versatile. Like, I mean, this evening I will have it when I go home and cook up some backstrap. I'm going to eat it with my blackberry pepper jelly. Because you have the fortunate luck of having a husband who hunts. Yes, I do. So you have venison and wild hog yes. and in I the freezer at all it. times. Yes. Probably the only time we... uh purchase anything any protein is maybe chicken some shrimp of course the shrimp's going to be local mm -hmm. um but we fish and then he hunts and so uh, pickles and preserves mm -hmm. um, especially if you pick the right fruit can be a great if the gaminess of local game is an issue for yeah. anyone it, they're really helpful and i think too a lot of people think that uh it's a gamey meat but really if it's cleaned properly it's not very gamey at all. But, like, even if, say, you don't have uh, venison uh, on pork, mm -hmm. it's delicious. I mean, put it on, put some fig pepper jelly, like, do, like, a Greek burger with some feta cheese and fig pepper jelly. Oh, yeah, Delicious. Oh, you that know? sounds amazing. Yeah, there's so many things to do with pepper jelly. It should be a staple in every kitchen. Okay. Well, you and I are going to be cooking together in the cooking segment, and I think it's settled. Yeah. We're making pepper jelly? Yeah. Okay. I'm excited. Okay. All right. Tell everyone where they can find Grinning Jupiter products. So uh, if you're online, uh, at the moment, I still have an Etsy store, and so it's under Grinning Jupiter Jamry on Etsy. Um, if you're in Baton Rouge, Red Six Spice, of course. Yay. Uh, if you're in Bro Bridge, Kushan Cannery. Um, if you're in Gonzales, Starlight Cafe. Also, Lafayette, uh, Great Harvest. 
And every Saturday. Oh, every Saturday I am at uh, the Lafayette Artisans Farmer's Market. Beautiful farmer's market. It's a great farmer's market. There's Cajun music playing. All the vendors are just sweet, good people. Like, it's a really good time. Uh, right now we're still in the Oaks part of it, so we're all under the trees. But the park itself is expanding tremendously. And uh, so there's a lot of renovation going on. And soon the whole park itself is going to be interactive, not just with our farmer's market, but fishing ponds and walkways and dog parks. And Lafayette just has the best people. Like, I truly love going to the farmer's market every Saturday. It's a lot of good people. I like it too. So if that's driving distance for anyone, definitely make it, um, make and it, of course, put it on Lafayette, your list. They're going to have something else going on too. There will be right. another festival or somewhere else you can, something you can do in the afternoon. Right. Yeah. Well, this was fun. Thank you, Ashley. Yes, thank you for having me.